Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. Well, welcome everybody to Fortress on a Hill. Uh, we have a, uh, a new guest today, someone I'm, uh, I'm really excited for us to ch- chat with. Uh, Christian Sorensen is here to talk to us about his new book, Understanding the uh, War Industry. Christian does uh, a lot of activism around military contracting, and um, he's going to tell us a lot more about that. So Christian, how you doing? Doing really well. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. Glad to. Uh, Glad to have you here. So, will you give us uh, give us the ten cent version of uh, how you got into studying military contracting? So, long story short, after I got out of the military, sort of just try to process everything. I uh, began studying the contracts, um, not with any intent to really do anything with it, but after a while, it sort of developed into a hobby. So, every duty day around uh, five Eastern. Pentagon puts up on its website uh, who it's contracted with during the course of that day. So I take these contracts, I distill them, and I try to see who's profiting from war. And, uh, you know, the average list is sort of a jumble, but over time, if you, uh, if you break them down, you can see who the, uh, who the corporations are, what are the main locations, you know, where, where are the, uh, the nodes of industry, if you will. Uh, what are the big ticket items? What are the uh, what are the Pentagon spending priorities? And um, you know you can then go to their websites and these corporations, war corporations are just like any other corporation. So they have to market their products. So their press releases are very uh, very illustrative. And so um, yeah, you can see what military units, the uh, so-called contracting activities are purchasing the goods and services and um, see how these contracts change over time. So like, I don't know, for example, four years ago, I never really saw the word cyber in any of the contracts. And now cyber cyber is a a billable category and um, you see a lot of that. So after about, I don't know, five, six years of studying these things, I felt it was about time to put this, uh, put pen to paper. And um, I'm very grateful for uh, Clarity Press out of Atlanta to grateful for their courage because they published it. And um, so, yeah, so it's, uh, it's what I have from those contracts sort of blended with the, uh, the really good work of researchers and journalists. And uh, I try to paint a picture of the overall military industrial congressional triangle, the complex, the MIC, and in particular, the, the war industry, the industrial side. I was uh, I was fascinated how you broke down uh, the various contractors and subcontractors um, by area and seeing you know that the the, the massive complex that is around Washington D.C. and all those contractors, San yeah. Diego, Dallas, Fort Worth, um, and and some of these places are even a bit removed from real military bases, but there still might be a big conglomeration of contractors still working on that stuff in those areas right right so just uh just to mention uh for our for our listeners uh the main locations are huntsville alabama which was originally um i guess the site of the old uh uh, rocket program post-world war ii where uh, a lot of the old nazi scientists went and um so huntsville every every major war corporation has a has a, an office in Huntsville, uh, multiple offices actually. And they work, uh, they work in and out of Huntsville and they work uh, on Redstone Arsenal down there. So then you got, uh, like you mentioned, the uh, sort of Northeast Virginia through DC and up into Baltimore, that's a huge one. 
Maryland, anything in and around uh, Fort Meade. You have the Dallas-Fort Worth region of Texas. You have Southern California. And then uh, there are a lot of up and coming locations like uh, Tampa, Florida is huge these days. Um, thanks to uh, Special Operations Command and Central Command down at, um, down at uh, the Air Force Base down there. So you, uh, you also have Silicon Valley, you have Greater Boston, Massachusetts, um, you know, Dayton, Ohio. So yeah, there are a lot of, a lot of spots. So I, I had jotted down a few notes about my experiences with contractors when I was in before we got started. And aside from the, the kind of standard deployed soldier, you know, go to the chow hall, see guys at the gates, uh, checking IDs, those kind of things overseas. Right. Um, the ones that were very much in my face was that the Department of the Army made a huge transition from <laughs> having active duty MPs do their patrol work to DA civilian cops. Yeah. So they slowly and slowly have taken over more and more of that. And I'm, I'm assuming that for most major installations now, it's just DA cops, you know, act, actual MPs who, you know, that's their home on the base versus contractors that work off post by design because they can't live on a post, um, come in and take over those jobs. Yeah. Yeah, so they, um, security, base security is sold um, as a distinct, uh, you know, good or service, but it's also sold as part of what they call base operations support services or BOSS. And so BOSS is just everything that, you know, it takes to run an installation from taking out the trash to, uh, you know, snowplow to mowing the lawn. And, and that's stuff back in the day that the, the soldier, the sailor, the airman, the marine, you know, did. And there was nothing, uh, there's nothing wrong with that system you know, it worked really, really well. You know, there's always somebody on base who doesn't have enough to do. You task them, you get it done. And that's, uh, you know, that's how we did it. But as, uh, you know, the corporate takeover of, of the U.S. government in general, uh, the Pentagon in specific, you now have BOSS as, uh, as one of the many profitable business sectors of war, essentially. And you see this at, you see the stateside, you also see this overseas. So you'll see BOSS contracts for, U.S. presence in or the occupation in Iraq, op occupation in Afghanistan, uh, bases in Turkey, bases throughout Europe. Uh, you'll see it in the, the Far East. Uh, you'll see it in Japan. You'll see it in Guam is a huge boss place. But there's, uh, you know, there are many profitable sectors of war. There's propaganda. There's public relations, uh, recruitment and retention. Anytime, you know, I never knew this, but anytime you see a uh, you know, a slick ad on TV or a banner ad on, uh, on the website. Uh, that's a, it's a corporation. That's a, you know, public, uh, you know, PR firm that does that. And, um, you know, there's office work, there's consulting, advisory assistance, um, advisory and assistance contracts you see all the time now. Anything that has to do with business or logistics or, you know, one of the insidious things now is we see a lot of contracts for cost reduction. So they'll shell out, they'll shell out eight figures for cost reduction. And this is absurd. I mean, you'll see it um, not just, uh, you know, one of the famous examples would be Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin's F-35 is, is a boondoggle. It can't even shoot straight. It's horrible. You know, Lockheed Martin promised to promise the world with this aircraft. And it came up with, frankly, a fairly mediocre, mediocre platform. And um, so you'll see that, uh, yeah, you'll see that in uh, Lockheed Martin contracts. And you'll see Lockheed Martin getting cost reduction contracts for an, an overpriced underperforming you know platform and you'll see McKinsey and a lot of these other con uh, consulting firms getting in on that too so McKinsey will get paid eight figures in order to reduce the cost on uh, you know the the most expensive weapons platform in history you can't make this stuff up so just real quick other profitable business sectors of war include uh, nuclear weaponry construction is huge um, according to my calculations construction is the uh, or the Pentagon is the single biggest employer of construction workers in the United States. I never knew that. Um, special operations forces, any of the gear and the trinkets and the gizmos that those guys use, it's, um, you know, it's a huge sector. There's, there's uh, I think, 14 billion. Um, one of the local uh, economic councils down in Tampa cited, I think it was 13 or 14 billion recently, just running through, pumping through, um, you know, McDill Air Force Base down there. And, uh, you know, it's one of the ways that these, these war corporations, they, whenever there's a, you know, a major new, uh, new facility or a facility that gets a lot of attention from the Pentagon, they just swarm these war corporations. So then you have, uh, 
other profitable sectors, anti-ballistic missiles, anything to do with space, not just the satellites, but launching the satellites and um, monitoring the satellites, training, simulation, uh, ordnance. You know, when we think of the war industry, we typically think of, you know, the bombs and the bullets. And, uh, you know, the bombs are, that's a huge sector. The, uh, you know, the rockets and, uh, and the missiles, huge sector. But the bullets, I very rarely see a, a contract for small arms and light weaponry. You just, you really don't see it. In fact, information technology, by the, uh, in terms of sheer number of contracts, information technology is the, uh, you know, the big one. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, sort of a rundown of that. But, um, you know, Danny, I'd love to hear uh, sort of your experience with any, uh, any mercenaries, any desk mercenaries, any, uh, anybody who's getting paid to uh, do a job that is traditionally carried out by, uh, you know, the uniformed soldier, sailor, Amory Marine. Oh, abs absolutely. Um, everything you've said has brought up like more questions that I could ever answer than I could ever ask on one podcast. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember my first real, you know, introduction to like the, the legit old school mercenaries was uh, when one of my soldiers had been uh, pretty badly hurt. And, uh, you know, I was visiting him at the cash in Baghdad, right? The combat sport hospital and uh, in the, in the room next door, you know, I met these dudes who were visiting their friends. And so we were kind of hanging out in the, in the lobby and then smoking some cigarettes together. And uh, the, these were, these were contractors, you know, but like legit security contractors. I think there was a South African, a Brit and like an Aussie. It was like a who's who of like the white contractor, <laughs> right? Like yeah. typical mercenary old school, like right. 1970s wild geese style, uh, which is like an old movie with Richard Burton. But, you know, that was the intro. And I was like, what is going on? And then, of course, Blackwater shot up uh, that whole square full yep. of uh, civilians. And that happened when I was in Iraq. And we felt a lot of the fallout from that because, of course, the Iraqis don't differentiate between, uh, you know, uh, white Anglo folks with rifles wearing camouflage who are mercenaries versus American soldiers. So we all kind of bore the brunt. But then I started seeing it elsewhere, right? And and I'll and I'll ask you a bit about that. But I started seeing how everything from the gate guards to the you know the shit pumpers to I mean you name it were were sort of contracted out. And stats bear this out, right? So you know from Vietnam to Desert Storm, it's like ten times more contractors, you know, doing jobs that used to be done by folks wearing camo. And then between Desert Storm '91 and like 2003 in Iraq invasion, it's like 10 more times. And I, and I think the numbers are even worse than that. Yeah. But, uh, as I thought about like the contracting, right. Some of the stuff that you look at with specificity, I was, you know, reminded of some of the more extreme examples. And this one was a fictional account of a, uh, I think a real case, but that war dogs movie that was, uh, was out and, you know, half comedy, you know, miles Teller and, uh, Jonah Hill. Uh, mm. and I, and I, you probably have some comments on that, but you know that movie shows some of the absurdity of how you get a how you could get a contract during the war on terror. But my kind of on the ground cosmetic absurdity of as a commander throwing really hundreds of thousands of dollars at local nationals to do differing contracts for uh, space improvement, et cetera, with just the minimal accountability, huge corruption, you know, fueling our enemies through kickbacks, knowingly doing so. You know, I saw all that, but I think that even I was surprised when I started, you know, reading your stuff and, and other actual like studies, right, analyses of this. I was even surprised to find out how much of the absurdity that I saw on the ground that I thought was just the lunacy of the Afghan war is actually not that different from the absurdity that goes on at the macro level, right? That what we yeah. study here at home. And so, I don't know, I thought maybe you could comment a little bit about that, right? Like how the system actually works of bids and, and, and this whole process, because uh, I think most people might not realize how uh, un, you know, how lack the lack of oversight of the system. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I will background that by just saying that, um, you know, corporations are the most powerful entity um, on earth right now. And war corporations are the most powerful entity um, out of that bunch, you know. And they have um, – the way the military-industrial-congressional complex is, is organized, um, 
uh, sort of aids and abets um, what would be considered criminality in any other um, in any other form. So I, I say that the the MIC, the military industrial congressional complex, is insulated, and you know we it's insulated because we you know we as citizens now um, or civilians now we have. Uh, you know, we have no, we have no effect on the military. That's obvious. We have no effect on industry. Okay. Right. Those are, those are two, um, you know, sort of closed sections, um, closed from the average, you know, the average Joe. However, we are supposed to have influence on the congressional side of things. And yeah, we, you know, we elect the Congress people, they, uh, they do what we say, but unfortunately industry, you know, corrupts Congress before they even, they, before they even get to Capitol Hill. So you have, um, you know, you have a situation where, you know, we know lobbying, we know lobbying, lobbying, you know, once they get to Capitol Hill, you know, the lobbyists swarm. All right. So, but before then, you know, if you, Henry and you, Danny are, you know, running for a, a congressional seat, uh, one for the red team, one for the blue team, I, the war corporation fund both of you and with campaign finance. And then whoever gets into, uh, gets into office owes me a favor. So you're corrupted before you even set foot on Capitol Hill. And then insidiously, I spread, quote unquote, uh, you know, jobs throughout uh, other congressional districts, in, you know, yours, your congressional district and others, so that I get everyone pretty, uh, pretty wrapped up in the whole thing. Now, um, the jobs are all the jobs figures are always hyped, always hyped. And um, there's no accountability because those in Congress who are supposed to be holding these uh, corporations to account are the ones taking money from and lobbyists from uh, the very corporations. So uh, a corporation you know, and just real quick, the top five are uh, the top five in core in terms of, um, you know, market share, or for lack of a better word, um, out of the war corporations are Lockheed Martin, Raytheon Technologies, Boeing, General Dynamics and Northrop Grumman. And um, so they'll, um, you know, they'll quote unquote, I guess, prepare the terrain by spreading these, you know, jobs around and all the all the congressional side wants to do is just say jobs, you know, uh, there's no there's no accountability and if say they do actually hire you know 300 people at the Raytheon plant in El Segundo California say that actually happens there's no obligation for for Raytheon or whatever the corporation is to hold on to those jobs and uh, you know corporations across the board are automating and exporting jobs and there's there's no there's um, you know the war industry is no exception so they will automate and they have every job that they can. They're trying to, just like any other ferocious corporate entity, cut costs. So industry hypes the jobs, jobs figures, which Congress eagerly cites. Uh, the jobs can actually be direct jobs. You know, like I hire you, Frank, at uh, you know, the plant in, um, I don't know, uh, somewhere in Ohio making armored vehicles. All right, fine. But um, industry also includes in their tallies um, indirect jobs and, and induced jobs. So Say we hire, um, you know, 500 people uh, in Sterling Heights, Michigan, to uh, build an armored vehicle. Um, we'll include, you know, a thousand jobs in that hire in in the uh, in the tallies that we then, you know, hand to our congressperson. Uh, our being, you know, our the war industry's congressperson, and um, you know, these induced jobs will be like, oh, the uh, you know the, I don't know the you know mother of two using a uh, ride sharing app to shuttle you know, one industry person from, you know, the pub to the, uh, you know, from the pub to home or from, or the, uh, you know, local, local guy working three jobs. One of which is at a diner where the, um, you know, local executive eats. I mean, it, it's, so the, the jobs titles are, the jobs uh, tallies are always overinflated. And um, so it's, it's, it's an insulated uh, triangle, military, industry, Congress, it's insulated. And you can see this uh, in a real insidious way with the, uh, with the recent pandemic. And, um, you know, you'd think, you'd think in a functioning democracy, um, quote unquote, that, you know, during a pandemic, the government would take care of the, of the public, but it hasn't. Um, the military industrial congressional complex has, has chugged along as if it's any other year. I mean, how, how, in, you know, in living Pete, can you give the war machine $750 billion, give or take, during a pandemic while simultaneously denying the American public health care, universal health care, Medicare for all, at the same time where 
you have a huge unemployment crisis from the pandemic. You're not addressing that. At the same time, you're not addressing the housing crisis. People are getting kicked out of their homes. So um, it really insulates, uh, it really demonstrates the insulated nature of the MIC. I mean, the ruling class has demonstrated their absolute disregard in 2020, uh, disregard at best or contempt at worst of the, uh, the American public. And, um, you know, U.S. military gets $750 billion this, you know, this fiscal year or this upcoming fiscal year. The Center of Disease Control, CDC, $8 billion. I mean, the numbers are staggering. Um, Newsweek reported in March when the, when the pandemic was really kicking off here that uh, one year worth of nuclear weapons spending would provide 300,000 uh, intensive care unit beds, 35,000 ventilators, and salaries of something like 75,000 doctors. I mean, this is criminal. This is criminal. When Eisenhower famously said that, you know, every bomb, every bullet, et cetera, is, t- is basically taking uh, bread out of the public's mouth. I mean, it's, it's, it's true. And Eisenhower had his flaws, you know, as you know, you two know. Um, but, uh, you know, we're really, in a, we're really in a bind here. And I don't see it getting, uh, you know, getting any better. Would you talk a bit about the, the diffuse nature of military contracting, especially under globalization? and how American patriotism can sometimes fit into that? Sure. So one of the things um, I noticed in the pandemic is um, the U.S. government pressuring the Mexican government and the Canadian government to, uh, to resume uh, production early on. You know, people, sh- you know, government shut down and um, the Mexican government in particular, because while Mexico never, almost never shows up in the Pentagon contracts because the Pentagon contracts deal with, you know, basically the, um, the primary uh, purchaser and Mexico usually is far down the supply chain. So you'll never really get a corporation um, based in Mexico uh, that shows up in the, in the contracts. But I mention it because, um, you know, Mexico and, um, you know, even China are, um, are down the, uh, the supply line. So you have, um, you know, there was a Pentagon report the other day that, and if I'm not answering your question, please let me know, but I think I'm going in the right direction. Um, there was a uh, report the other day where Ellen Lord, who used to, she, this is very illustrative, she used to be, um, you know, one of the executives at Textron which is one of the uh, major corporations in the war industry. And she's now in charge of Pentagon acquisition. She's um, her formal, former title, formal title is, I think, Undersecretary of uh, Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. And uh, she basically said that, look, we, uh, our microprocessors are, you know, a lot of them come from China and we can't, uh, due to, globalization, due to outsourcing, due to shoving these jobs overseas. Um, and she didn't use the words I'm about to use, but, um, you know, they were doing that in order to, you know, not only stiff the U.S. Uh, working class, but also to, uh, you know, to cut down on costs. You know, if you pay people like people in the corporate headquarters in Northeast Virginia or in, um, you know, Bethesda, Maryland or anywhere, of these war corporations, they make eight figures a year precisely because they do not pay the working class a fair, livable, honest wage, a wage that reflects what the working class puts in to the uh, war goods and the war services. And so, um, you know, same thing with Bezos, same thing with any of these um, billionaires that our society, um, you know, lauds. And um, so, yeah, so there is a uh, diffuse nature and um, in, from the Pentagon's point of view, it's coming back to bite them in the, in the keister because they're saying, um, or they're claiming as part of great power competition, as part of the hype of China as a quote unquote enemy the new, uh, in the new Cold War, that um, our microprocessing uh, industrial base is, is at risk. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I think I uh, you know, got somewhere in the ballpark. How was it? Oh, totally, totally. <laughs> cool. um, 
No, the, the, one of the things that I've, I've, I've thought about before, but your book illustrated it to a degree that it just could, couldn't ignore it is, you know, that, that the worker at, at, at contractor A, wherever they happen, happen to be, may only end up making one tiny spring that goes yeah. in a circuit board, that goes in a missile, that goes on a fighter. But that person is brought into a, a great world of patriotism by their mm. contribution to the pipeline, even if it's a relatively small thing. And, you know, it, it, it goes back to guys, you know, they jo- somebody joins JAG or they join finance or something under the mistaken belief that because they're not a, a trigger puller, they're not taking lives. They're not right. involved in that part. And this, by the, by the advent of globalization, by how much it's increased, that situation is, is made much, much worse as time goes on. Yes. Yes. And to which I'll add, um, the war corporations, they know what they're doing. You know, they will play, um, they really hype up um, what I called traditional patriotism. And Danny's so much better um, at analyzing this than I am. But um, in, in my book, I, I, I use the term traditional patriotism in order to indicate um, what, we, what we as a society, you know, waving the flag, rallying around the, the troops, this and that. And the war corporations do... Uh, do a really excellent job at, um, at at playing to this. So they'll you know they'll hang the flags in in the um, in the factories. They'll uh, put uh, pictures of active duty troops up in the factories. They will um, they'll do they'll do anything in order to um, make and sort of uh, imbue the the working class within these factories uh, an understanding in those workers that. Um, you know, when you're, when you're building anything, any part, any good or service that ends up being purchased by the, uh, by the Pentagon, by the Department of War, they, um, you know, you're helping the soldier, the sailor, the airman, marine, and they really play on that, on that sense of patriotism. And um, so it's like, it's, there, there are many reasons why somebody would work. And I want to, I want to state that I understand, I'm not, I'm not shaming anyone. If you, you know, the, the U.S. working class is beat up. The jobs are exported. The jobs are automated. Um, you know, everyone, everyone's hurting. I get that. So I'm not shaming anyone right now, but it is important to understand why uh, people within the, um, you know, why would somebody work for the war industry? And you alluded to patriotism, tradition, what I call traditional patriotism, and that's, that's huge. That's so important. That's one of the ways that they do it. Um, also, you know, money. Um, you know, the average, you know, working, uh, working stiff, um, you know, it doesn't make a lot within the war industry, but it is, it will put, um, you know, food on the table or food on the family, as uh, George W. Bush once said. And um, they also use civilian use, you know, they'll say, you know, if you corner someone, you'll say, you know, I did a few interviews for this. And, um, you know, one of the justifications, especially the, you know, the mid-level and the higher ups will say is, hey, you know, um, look at all we've, um, we've brought you, you know, we've brought you, we, you know, the, the quote unquote defense industry, we've brought you the internet, the jet engine radar, you know, and yeah, those are all fine and good. But imagine, imagine what you could do if you, if you, um, you know, spent that kind of research and development money, you know, 700 billion annually, 750 billion annually, um, into other departments, education, labor, commerce, housing and urban development, uh, health and human services, agriculture, interior, transportation. Imagine what they could do with that kind of money over time, non-stovepiped, non-compartmentalized, you know, research, original research that requires, you know, openness and transparency, free flow of information, unlike military research, which is, which is stovepiped, compartmentalized and on, on vicious deadlines. Uh, You know, imagine the polymaths that could, uh, that could sprout up within that and imagine the benefits for, for, you know, to society. And, um, so the, the argument that civilian use of military technology or ancillary benefits, it's, it's just hogwash, you know? So there's traditional, um, traditional patriotism. There is, you know, money, there's civilian use. And there's also what you, what you alluded to is, is just plain old distancing, you know, the, uh, the dispersed nature of, of, you know, people working in plants all over the country, um, um, you know, they, they focus on their daily tasks, you know, they, they, you know, so, so what if they, it, you know, slaughter someone in Yemen or in Palestine or in Afghanistan or Pakistan or Colombia or, you know, the Philippines or Mali or wherever the, you know, the giant, uh, you know, 
uh, a corporatized war machine, you know, happens to be. And, and public relations personnel within the, the major war corporations are very good at this. They'll say, you know, you know, we manufactured the missile. You know, we weren't there using the missile. You know, it's, um, it's, really, uh, it's really insidious. Or they'll say, hey, you know, you know, how great the, you know, we interviewed the troops when they got back. Uh, and how great was it? You know, they came, you know, they really, they really appreciated our, you know, fill in the blank name the weapons platform they you know they really appreciated it they'll say oh you know we're doing it for the troops you know and um yeah it's pretty uh it's pretty bad so uh i hope i answered your question sorry for the rant but it's uh it's important to get into some of this stuff the guys and i love doing the podcast being able to share our experiences in the military with allies and supporters means the world to us but we can't do all the work we need you to share an episode of ours with someone anyone whom you like might think might be affected by it young people looking to join the military or parents advocating for one conscientious citizens who care about the violence the u.s wages in their name advocates for women and people of color who understand the harsh environment the military creates for females and minorities and inflicts on minorities around the globe and anyone else you think it might affect please take a moment pause the episode share this with them now our podcast is supported in a few different ways first there's patreon where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping the guys and i pay for some of the podcast's expenses those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned right here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to, uh, to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can keep us going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and more I'm sure I can't think of at the moment. So, let's bring out these honorary producers, and they are Will Arenz, Fahim Shirazi, James Obar, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Emma P., Janet Hansen, Lawrence Taylor, Tristan Oliver, Marwan Marwan, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can always contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Forge Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt.com. Make sure you check for promo codes before you order. And now, let's get back to the podcast. No, no, I, I, all, uh, great stuff. Go ahead, Danny. Yeah, I, I think it's great. And, you know, patriotism uh, as defined and, you know, puncturing the myth is one of my recent areas. But mm. what struck me about what you were saying is the way, the venality sort of of the way these corporations, these defense contractors in the industry will like play on the patriotism of their workers and of the public. Uh, you know, and how do we do this? I mean, it starts, it seems to me, it starts on the factory floor and correct me if I'm wrong, but where they'll have, or in the corporate offices where these guys making 40 to 60 grand a year, maybe creating the tools of war, or yeah. uh, they've got to look at the propaganda on the wall that says stuff like, this is who we serve, right? And that's pictures exactly. of like uniform clad folks. And then it goes all the way up to the Megatron and sort of like, oh, this football game halftime show brought to you by Lockheed Martin. Exactly. Right? And so it goes, it, it runs that span. And, uh, you know, I, I guess you've already sort of talked about it, but I mean, you know, how this really just lends itself to just get into the society's veins. And do you think it causes a lack of questioning? Does it, does it stifle some of even just regular society's willingness to question them if they can fall back on, Hey, look, we're serving the troops. And, and of course we're not responsible for what they do afterwards, as you mentioned. Right. Yeah, no, you really nailed it. And it's the propaganda, (coughs) excuse me, 
the propaganda that comes out of these uh, these war corporations is um, is just incredible. I mean, you'll see when you go onto their websites or their YouTube channel or you you know talk to them, they it, it's you know the flag in the background, the troops saluting. There was one corporation. Uh, the name escapes me. It might have been Periton. I don't know. And, um, you know, on his website, it actually bragged about, um, it, it actually said, you know, not only do we serve our troops, which is a common refrain among corporations, the corporations using the phrase our troops, as if we're all on the same team, as if there's no profit making incentive, um, you know, within the corporate uh, C-suite. Um, but, the, you know, this, this corporation, you know, in addition to using the our troops thing, basically said, um, we, we, do, uh, we spread freedom and democracy around the world. We spread freedom. And so it's, they're, they are, uh, it's really insidious. And unfortunately, um, and I look forward to reading your book, Patriotic Descent, because I know it touches on this and uh, you know, really dives into it and breaks it down in, in, in a great way. But um, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's so pervasive and it's so, um, so harmful. And, and the corporate media backs it up. Um, you know, there's a reason that uh, General Dynamics, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and a lot of the big ones take out um, advertisements on corporate media. And it's um, precisely to make sure that the, you know, the Sunday morning talk show doesn't talk about this stuff, doesn't uh, question endless war. I mean, there's no, there's no functional reason why Lockheed Martin or anybody, any major war corporation would be advertising because um, Joe Schmo, who's watching the, you know, the Sunday talk show, is not buying an F-35 is not buying a, you know, a general dynamic submarine or any of this stuff. So um, if you are, you know, Chuck Todd or whatever, whatever you know, corporate celebrity is hosting, uh, you know, you can't go against the advertisers. You simply can't. And so it's one way that the that industry confines the narrative um, within corporate media. And, um, you know, there are many other ways. The, the, the think tanks, the job of a think tank, uh, basically, and essentially, is to put out information that aligns with the profit motive of who is donating or funding the think tank. So if I'm a billionaire um, or if I'm a war corporation and I fund the center, CSIS, what is it? The Center for Strategic International Studies or um, uh, what's the other one? The uh, Center for, uh, or the New America, New America or any of these. They, they take money from the war corporation and they put out uh, information favorable to the war corporation. And these days, that involves pushing the uh, the great power competition, quote unquote, which is basically Cold War 2.0. Um, and you, you need an enemy. You need an enemy. So, you know, the war on terror lasted 20 years, and it was good from a corporate perspective. Um, but you simply cannot, and, and the war on terror will continue. It, it will continue. But you simply cannot justify the uh, sale and purchase and uh, production and marketing of big ticket items, you know, cyber, satellites, uh, you know, submarines, anti-ballistic missiles. You can't, you can't justify those by pointing to a bunch of, you know, at best, uh, you know, ragtag, uh, you know, jihadists in the uh, Iraqi or Syrian desert. You can't. So that's, I firmly believe, and I try to document in uh, understanding the war industry, uh, I try to you know, show how you need this enemy and the enemy, um, you know, it, um, it, it provides the justification. And so they, they do it through corporate media and, um, you know, they do it through the think tanks. And um, I also see this, uh, just to wrap up, I see this play out daily in the contract announcements. It's all over the contracts. And, you know, when you take it year by year, you know, we're about to wrap up fiscal year 2020. It, it ends in, at the end of September. And I encourage everyone to, you know, check out the contracts on the Pentagon's website. It's uh, under, I think, newsroom and then contracts. You go to, you know, defense.gov or whatever the, the current, uh, you know, um, link is. And um, you should, everyone should do that. But and I understand that people are, you know, busy and people are hurting and they don't have the time. But if anybody has any time, go to that website, go to the Pentagon's website, contracts, newsroom, uh, at the end of September, the, the last few days, because you will see in all its glory, all of the contracting activities, um, you know, they have fallout money. And I'm sure you guys have seen this, uh, you know, on the, on the low scale, uh, you know, I did in the Air Force of, um, you know, every unit within the military 
must spend its money by the end of the fiscal year or risk losing um, such a, uh, you know, such a high uh, amount of uh, such a large budget in the next one. So if there's no incentive to economize, there's no incentive to, to reduce your budget, you must spend it all or risk uh, having a, a lower budget, you know, next fiscal year. So you'll see it at the end of September, the last week, especially the last two days, you know, billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars are just thrown at the, at the war industry. And so in general, in fiscal year 2020, I hope to come out with a, a report on this, uh, you know, but when, when I've processed it all in October and November, um, I see the trends this year, just the goods and services that are purchased um, by the Pentagon from the war industry uh, really are increasingly targeted, uh, targeting Russia and China. You know, you can't have cyber, you can't have nuclear modernization, new submarines, uh, National Reconnaissance Office and Air Force uh, satellite launches. Uh, hypersonics is a new category that never never existed in Pentagon contracts until you know this past year uh, or the year before. I think fiscal year, if I remember correctly, 2019 was the first time hypersonics ever showed up. Now, uh, research and development on new long range missiles, um, you know, corporatized intelligence, um, new engine propulsion research and de uh, development, undersea drones, cloud computing. I mean, you'll see all of this stuff is is um, you know going after Russia and China. And not to say that necessarily the industry wants war with China. It is far more profitable right now to just demonize the ever-living daylights out of Russia, demonize the ever-living daylights out of China, you know, and then use that demonization as a means to say, hey, shoot, well, Pentagon needs huge, huge budgets, and we, industry, need, uh, you know, you got to purchase our goods and services because we will provide. Uh, yeah. Sorry for the rant. Oh, no, no, this is great. I would like to follow up on something that's kind of, specific that you mentioned earlier that I think relates to this. Um, mm. And it's, it's kind of like that PR side. It's kind of like that selling side, but it's this word consulting, right? And then you mentioned McKinsey and company earlier, and I'm like super glad you did because I just have a hard on for certain like organizations and people. <laughs> and McKinsey's one of them because, you know, I do a lot of like Mick research and you know one of the things I did recently or, or last early last year was or early this year was look into the like West Point class of 86 which is Pompeo and Esper's crew and that was a great you know, piece I, great oh piece. thanks man and I found like way more than I expected but like one of the things that I noticed was that so many of their classmates at some point in their career work for McKinsey and yeah. when you look down you mentioned earlier how the the MIC is going to fund, right? The war industry is going to fund both the Democrats and the Republicans. And I was just, you know, thinking about people off the top of my head that I know at one point or another were from McKinsey. And so on the Democrat side, you got Mayor Pete, right? Better yep. than Mayor Pete Buttigieg. You got like Super Rice has some connections. You know, you got Chelsea Clinton, Peter Orzag, who was like this Obama OMB guy. And also, oh, by the way, you mentioned think tanks is a Brookings dude. And then, of course, you got Bobby Jindal, former Republican presidential candidate, and my friend and yours, Tom, slavery was a necessary evil cotton, <laughs> right? So yeah. you got both sides who have some connection to McKinsey. And so I guess my question is, in a general sense, McKinsey's interesting, but in a general sense, what do consultants, you know, do? And, and, and where does this consulting aspect fit into, I mean, you could might as well call it the consulting industrial complex, but where does yeah. that fit into the broader picture that you study? Great question. Great question. So until I would say the turning point um, in the daily Pentagon contracts was the quote unquote audit of the Pentagon, um, you know, is at the end of what was it must have been the end of fiscal year 2019. Um, so the Pentagon, I mean, this has been well documented, the Pentagon was year after year not in compliance with federal law because federal law required, I think since the 90s, that every, um, every department undergoes an audit. And the Pentagon was always like, yeah, yeah, we'll get around it, we'll get around it. So eventually, I think it was under when Leon Panetta was, uh, was in charge. He, I mean, the man was brilliant in all the, all the evil ways. He really, um, he was very creative, he was very, uh, you know, friendly, avuncular, and he was, you know, he, he steered the, the Pentagon well from the, from the Pentagon's perspective, and he agreed to do the audit, and so the audit was just, um, it was basically, all right, we, the Pentagon, we, the U.S. Armed Forces, are not going to conduct the audit. We will hire consultants to come in 
uh, typically the big, um, what do you call those? The big uh, financial firms. So the likes of uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers, um, KPMG, and uh, and those. So they'll come in and they'll do the audit for us. Now the audit was, I think it was Pat Shanahan who uh, the former um, uh, was he Raytheon? Where did he, oh he's Boeing, the former Boeing uh, executive who then became Secretary of Defense or Secretary of War, depending on your uh, your perspective. He said. Famously, yeah, we, uh, you know, we didn't pass the audit, but we never expected to pass. So it was, um, it was designed just sort of to like, uh, to show, uh, it, was a, it was a show of, um, you know, compliance from the beginning. And after that, uh, I saw just more and more of these consulting firms coming in, not just the, the big um, uh, financial, the big four financial firms, uh, which by the way, not just, they don't just sell um, audit services to the Pentagon. They sell all sorts of uh, advisory. Um, but after that, I see, saw you know more and more of these um, consulting firms come in. So to answer your question, sorry for the for the um, setup here, but I needed to uh, sort of get that uh, you know get that uh, history laid out. Uh, to answer your question, your question was what do the what do they do? You know what do these consultants uh, do? And the answer is <laughs> everything that the generals should be doing. Um, and in in, in typical corporate fashion, they, they create new categories of profit that which they then say, hey, the Pentagon, you want us to do this? And Pentagon's like, yeah, sure. So, for example, um, 1 November 2019, and I'm just you know, looking at uh, this fiscal year, uh, 2020. Now, there are examples you know, from other fiscal years, but this is um, illustrative. So, Bose Allen uh, Hamilton, 1 November 2019, Strategic Workforce Analysis Planning and Management. Provide support services to strategic workforce planning and analysis initiatives to support career field managers and organizational talent. I mean, just it's, it's corporate uh, BS at its finest. Um, you have, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this one, D-E-L-O-I-T-T-E. -E. It's one of the big ones. And I always say Deloitte, but I don't know if I'm, or Deloitte, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but they will. Uh, it's, it's Deloitte and, and Deloitte. I. Yes. classmates of mine who I love and respect have worked for them, right? <laughs> oh. Just to, to like, no, because I mean, it's an important point, right? This yeah. is how pervasive it is. Go ahead. Yes. No, no, that's, and that's great to, that's great to point out because, you know, uh, as we, as we touched upon, you know, if you're, if you're just doing it in the nitty gritty in the day to day and you're focusing on your task, you really don't believe that you're part of the problem in a lot of these things. You know, if you're, you just get, you know, you're making ends meet and you're just, you know, um, you know, a contractor for one of these, one of these firms. So, uh, would you say it was Deliot, Delwatt? What was it? Deloitte is that, Deloitte. I think it's Deloitte. I think that's how Deloitte. they said it. Yeah. yeah. So I'm they'll sell. Um, that, but I'm pretty sure. So you'll have something like um, uh, any of these undersecretary and deputy undersecretary and admin and uh, assistant deputy undersecretary positions love this stuff. So um, you know that corporation will be uh, you know 17 June 2020 advisory and assistance services to support the deputy assistant secretary of the Air Force Office of Business Transformation and Deputy Chief Management Officer in managing and improving strategic transformation initiatives at the enterprise level. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's nonsense. You know, if, if the generals and the admirals cannot do their own paperwork, if they cannot make these calls, if they cannot do analysis, what are you doing? What are you doing? What, what is your purpose? What are, you, are, you are a, uh, you know, a barnacle on the, on the keister of, uh, of the, uh, you know, what should be a, a functioning you know, military, um, Boston Consulting Group, out of uh, which contracts out of Bethesda, Maryland, on uh, 21 November 2019, cost transparency to facilitate the design of an optimized maintenance program to include design of governing governance processes of the reliability control board. Um, you know, it's just like, you know, um, same corporation, uh, 13 April 2020, support DOD chief management office assessing at least 90% of annual spending, implementing and training to increase department's efficiency speed. I mean, it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. This is stuff that should not be, not only should not be, um, you know, given to the corporate sector. This is stuff that you as a, as a competent flag officer should either be doing as part of your daily work or, you know, or, or don't do it. Like some of this stuff is just, you know, creative categories that corporate America comes up to and then just, then just pitches. Um, yeah, it's really, it's, it's very frustrating to see on the daily, but it's also frustrating to see on the, uh, you know, on the macro when you're looking at it um, over the course of, you know, an entire fiscal year. And this is money. Again, I cannot stress this enough. This is money 
that there are only X dollars that go around, as you guys know, and as you have pointed out very well on this podcast before, there are only X dollars that go around. And everything that is going into not just these, the consultancy class, not just you know uh, the local Beltway bandits, but the, the broader war industry could be and should be going elsewhere to actual national security, actual national security, you know, healthcare, homelessness, hunger. The, these are actual national security issues, not whether, you know, some clown entrepreneur, you know, I don't know, consultant, you know, can get, uh, you know, get his cookies doing, um, I don't know, analysis and advisory and assistance. So that was a great question. Thank you for that. I really do. Uh, that was great. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm glad that you, I, I love that you actually went back to like read off what they say they do, right? I mean, because it, it's so instructive and this idea that the generals and the senior officers have just obviated themselves, the responsibility is, is huge yeah. and something that really ties into that whole idea of just in general, the substitution of contractors for, you know, for green suitors, as we used to say, and showing yeah. how it goes beyond pumping the porta potties and fueling yeah. the trucks, right? It, it, it goes to the top level and then like enter the consultancy industrial yeah. complex. Uh, I, should, I should quickly point out though, that one of the real uh, pernicious trends lately, especially within the last two years is policy. Uh, a corporation will get hired to advise on policy in many of these offices. Now policy is the last place that a profit motivated corporate entity should be sticking its schnoz because you can't, you know, you're obviously going to get as a result, the recommendation will be, Hey, you know, you got to hire more consultants or, Hey, you know, you got to, you know, contract with this corporation or that corporation. There's no incentive to arrest the wars. There's no incentive to stop the, the self licking ice cream cone as many of these, um, you know, any of the, my betters in some of these really progressive, uh, you know, think tanks, not think tanks, but um, you know, uh, critically, you know, what is this, uh, you know, POGO, Project of Government Oversight, or, um, you know, all those great, uh, great groups that really uh, analyze as well. You know, they pointed this out. That's, uh, it's, yeah. So I just had to add that policy is, is, is increasingly being shoved off into the corporate sector. And that is the last thing that should ever be there. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's horrible. Well, fellas, I think that is a, a good place for us to wrap it up today. Christian, will you um, let the listeners know where they can keep up with your ongoing work? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you all for your time. This was, uh, I, I really appreciate it. And thank you for all the, the hard work y'all do. You, uh, you know, y'all were at the, uh, or have been at the vanguard, the forefront of uh, progressive thought um, in and among not just veterans, but you know, uh, you know, the public at large. Um, and th many thanks to Clarity Press for publishing Understanding the War Industry. You can find it at your local bookshop. Please order it through there. Uh, you know, as a last ditch thing, yes, you can get it through Amazon, but uh, please support your local, your local uh, bookshop. Uh, my website is ibpoffices.com and um, on my Twitter at CP underscore Sorensen, S-O-R-E-N-S-E-N. -S -E and um, if you don't mind, if you all have time, may I, may I ask you all a question? Please. Shoot, go for it, yeah. So how do you, so we're in the middle of, um, you know, the empire. We're in the middle of the beast, and, you know, the beast is, uh, it's on its decline, but it's, it's flailing, and it's hurting. It's hurting not just the people, you know, within the United States who don't get, uh, you know, the necessary uh, attention from the government in terms of, you know, programs of social uplift, but, uh, you know, the victims overseas across, you know, war zones, you know, not just in the Middle East, but in Latin America, Central America, uh, Southeast Asia. So we're in the middle of this beast. And, um, you know, it's hard to stay positive and it's hard to, it's hard to, uh, to live well. And I'm not saying, you know, live well as in like, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, a luxurious lifestyle, but how do you, how does one, whether civilian or veteran live well, healthily, uh, mentally, physically, socially, inside of inside of the beast. Henry, I'll I'll jump in first. That's cool um, because, like, typically, uh, uh, which is not always good for my mental health, uh, I jump on the radio in about ten minutes in DC to talk some of this stuff. 
Well, I love that question, uh, Christian. Uh, I think I'm a good person and the worst person to answer it all at once. Um, <laughs> I did not live well for a, a, quite a long time, both in uniform and then especially when I first got out. I mean, just just it was too much, you know, I mean, beyond the own, you know, my own diagnoses and mental health stuff, I think more of it was what you're saying. It's just the overwhelming feeling of inadequacy and futility, uh, fighting the empire, uh, whether, you know, a podcast and a pen, so to speak, has always felt a little paltry. Um, that said, uh, from a, you know, existentialist Camus perspective, as I am want to talk about, you know, there's this idea that even in an absurd universe, that doesn't mean that we can fall back on nihilism and that, you know, like Sisyphus pushing the boulder, we have to imagine him happy, right? And the struggle itself is worth it. Now, that sounds pretty pie in the sky, but in the lived experience, uh, I think I've finally sort of accepted that I can do what I can do. And that's about it. And knowing full well that, you know, what Bobby Kennedy called the ripples of hope, a uh, small number, uh, small acts by a large number of people can make a big difference. But I'll say this, uh, I'm a big Christopher Hitchens fan, despite him being dead to me for a long time for supporting the Iraq war, but he's a brilliant dude, uh, the late Christopher Hitchens. And he talks about how the dissidents, like in Eastern Europe and stuff, they had this concept under communism, under totalitarianism, they called it as if. And uh, the as if culture was, uh, I'm going to live as if I live in a free state, right? I'm going to perform as if. And it became this whole culture. And it was this kind of also kind of ridiculous, but beautiful thing. And uh, I think that the best most of us who are in this fight can do is live as if we live in a society that is not plagued by militarism, uh, live, live as if what we're doing is going to have a profound effect. And uh, that may sound like an imaginatory sort of thing, but even the anarchists believe that we can't expect people to uh, fight for a society that they have not seen or begun to live for. And so uh, I think that's important. It's, uh, it's helped me uh, as, as, again, crazy and philosophical as it sounds. And uh, I'll tell you, like you mentioned earlier, most people are just pay, pay, paycheck to paycheck and looking for those five minutes to breathe at the end of the day and expecting them to read my sometimes 5,000 word articles or go to the websites we tell them to can be tough. But uh, man, I'll tell you, five or 10 minutes a day of research and thinking about this and you know, one small act a week or a month or even a year from millions of people can make some sort of difference because damn, what, what tools do we have besides stopping traffic in the streets, which is of course where I think it should all end. So that was the longest rant ever that may or may not have answered your question. But oh, when you great. said it, all I could think about was as if, and I just always want an excuse to talk about it. So I did. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you. I think my ongoing, uh, journey to find peace we'll say is summed up kind of like this um did you guys see the kevin costner movie the guardian a few years ago about coast guard rescue swimmers no unfortunately no yeah so great movies as, as far as you know military oh, yeah, totally, yeah. movies but it, it is a, it is an amazing film they did a really good job with it um but at one point in the movie ashton kutcher's in it too and he's the protege to costner's long-suffered um, a rescue swimmer. He's done it his whole life, and he got sent to the sent to the schoolhouse to uh, deal with an injury. And, anyways, they end up at the same station partway through the movie. And he Ashton asks Costner. He says, "How do you decide? You know, if you're out there in the water and you have know that you have X amount of time to save three people, and you know you can only save one, how do you choose? How do you?" decide who lives and dies essentially and he said well you know a lot of other guys might have d different ideas about it but mine goes like this he says i swim as hard as i can for as long as i can and the sea takes the rest and that's you know kind of my acknowledgement of understanding that even you know uh, being disabled um, you know, having issues in my life that I can still be a positive force that I can right still learn and grow and create. And, um, but also an acknowledgement that even in trying to help, even in the, <clears throat> even in the drops in the bucket, 
that I acknowledge that I still have to take care of myself. Um, and so there's times where, you know, a headache, a really nasty headache comes up on me and I, I can't keep reading the book, whatever I'm reading, whatever article or subject, and I have to put it down and I have to take a nap or I have to do something that requires a lot less brain power, but I know that I'm still moving forward towards that ultimate goal. The other part is the rec is a recognition of who the good guys are. When I was a kid, when I was growing up, and when I first joined the military, I believed that the military could be a net force for good in the world overall. Mm -hmm. And there's never been an army in existence or a military in existence that has had anything close to that. It's just not the reality. Right. But there are people out there trying to fight against the the illegality of of are us taking war all over the planet. And those are the people that I say are the good guys. Those guys that even going through the most horrific things in the world, if they happen to be living in a country where America is dropping bombs, that they hold their loved ones tight and they try to keep going the best they can. And I, I think that's, that's all a person can really do. That's huge. That's, that's some wisdom right there. I really, um, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually, that's a perfect spot to end on too, you know? I think so. I, I, I agree with you. So, uh, Christian, thank you so much again for being here. I hope that we'll have you on again. Um, everybody, Absolutely. please go out and pick up Christian's amazing book, Understanding the War Industry. You said it's at uh, Clarity Press, correct? Correct. ClarityPress.com. And we'll make sure we have a, a link in the show notes so anybody that wants to go out and uh, pick up uh, pick up your book again so thank you. uh, thanks again man my pleasure take it easy gentlemen we're on twitter at fortress on a hill and also at facebook.com at fortress on a hill you can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com itunes stitcher google podcasts patreon spotify you name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. And listen to my song. Ah. Uh...